Welcome to a new episode of the Astro Podcast. Today we have with us historian of science Enrique Leitão, who is the uh, head of the Department of History and Philosophy of Science of the Faculty of Sciences of the University of Lisbon, and is here today to talk to us about uh, the role about his work, of course, and the role of the history of astrology in the history of science. How these two interconnect and mm how. -hmm. Um, what kind of interchange. So, welcome, welcome. to the Astro <laughs> Podcast. Yeah. Um, so, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and, and your... Uh, well, very, uh, very interesting topic. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, so I, you know, I, I, I did uh, sci uh, scientific studies. So, um, I have a, a degree in physics and then I pursued even up to the PhD level. So, my, my PhD actually is in theoretical physics. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did. I was you know, trained as a scientist and worked as a scientist. Actually, I have some, some you know, papers in science and did work in in, 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 in physics. But you know, all through my years doing physics, which were some years, uh, I, I had this interest for you know, historical studies and, mm -hmm. and for humanities in general, literary studies also, philosophy. Uh, and most of all ancient languages, languages in general and ancient languages, as a hobby. Mm -hmm. So I was a scientist, you know, working as a scientist, but with many side interests. Mm -hmm. and, and I was pursuing these interests with some sort of, you know, seriousness. So it was, this was not just, you know, uh, hobbies with no, uh, no interest. No, I was, you know, putting mm -hmm. some hours and doing it... Um, after a certain point, I started publishing some things, you know, minor papers, small work on on historical topics, the history of science, and this was a process that, you know, without even my control, uh, increased with time. And we're talking about a process that lasted, I don't know, ten years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, through throughout these ten years, I slowly, you know, diminished my production and activity in physics itself, in science itself, and increased my, my production in historical studies. At the same time, I tried to complement my training as a scientist with other topics. So, uh, you know, I, I entered, you know, I went back to school again in, in philosophy, history, and, you know, Latin Greek a little bit. Um, because I realized I had to, you know, perfect what I knew and improve my knowledge in those areas. And so this is it, basically this is the story. It was a slow process, not planned. I had never made any plans to become an historian of science. But the truth is that after a number of years, I realized that I could do a type of very specific work, which is this work in the history of science, very, very close mm -hmm. to documents, which is the, the type of work that I prefer. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so this is it, so... I would like to, you know, underline one point, which is the following. First, I maintain my passion for scientific topics, so I really enjoy science. Uh, and I realize how important the education as a scientist has been in my career, even as an historian, which I am now, you mm -hmm. know, for the past 20 years, I've been, you know, full-time historian. So what I do is, is history. And I, I fully understand the difference, methodological differences between the two activities. But the, the the training that I got as a scientist has proved to be has proven to be extremely important to me mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. in my career. And so I look back at my years as a scientist, and I recognize how important they were. They were mm -hmm. not by any means a waste of time. Mm -hmm. I acquired not only the skills, but most of all a certain type of mental attitude. You know, a certain in pursuit of exactness or to be you know sound mm -hmm. uh, to put it in very you know broad terms mm -hmm. and this has been very helpful yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the skills you mentioned uh, are probably uh, essential for being a sci uh, historian of science because there's this mm -hmm. uh, there's this um, under underlying question about what is the quality of a histor historian mm -hmm. of science 
Is it an historian without any knowledge of science? Mm -hmm. Is it a scientist that also mm -hmm. likes history? So, um, how do you, mm -hmm. what do you think about this? Because this is kind of an on mm -hmm. ongoing mm -hmm. yeah. uh, discussion. Yes, and, and for example, before you answer, in, in, in our interviews and in the podcast we have been having, and we're going to have people with a various, a very, very background from, from languages, areas. from the history yeah. of art, from science. Mm -hmm. So there is this. I, 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 don't, I don't feel that nowadays, the way it is done today, I don't feel that you need to be uh, to do to have the the total knowledge of the scientific content to do the, to do very good history of science. It is not it is not mandatory. I mean, if you do have it, this is an advantage. Mm -hmm. But of course, you can also uh, be so much of a scientist that you cannot, you know, move away from the mental mode of the scientist. And the mental mode of the of the historian is very, very different. Mm -hmm. And and so there is a work that needs to be done there. But so you know the beginning of your question was what is, what is the most important thing? Well the most important thing for me, and this is what from my point of view characterizes a really top scholar in this discipline is a person that is able to zoom in and zoom out of historical scientific problems, you know. Mm -hmm. That means it, a person that can go to the tiniest of details in a theory or an instrument or an apparatus or whatever phenomenon mm -hmm. and understand all the technicalities. And then it, this person is also able to zoom out and see the broader content. Mm -hmm. the institutional context, the social context, the philosophical implication, mm -hmm. the broader, the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the highest level. Very few people are able to do this with quality. Mm -hmm. This is what I always, you know, aimed at doing. Not that I'm able to do it, but this was also like my ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. And this is what I always suggest to students. I mean, if you want to be a very good, you know, top, you know, academic in this field, you should acquire the the type of skills and abilities that allow you to zoom in and zoom out a topic mm -hmm. because generally we all historians as as, as, every, as everybody we figure out our comfort zone right mm -hmm. and, and and we stay more or less in that comfort zone yeah. uh, but you know pushing our limits either on the more very technical side mm -hmm. or in the more broader uh, context. perspective context mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. This is always challenging, and it's always it's always it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Was there any particular field that uh, attracted you for the in the perspective of the history of science? Was it mathematics? Yeah, yeah. Well, it it disciplines with a mathematical background. Yeah. And astronomy, mathematics, astronomy. Astronomy. I, I, well, you know, astronomy was you know uh, one of my first loves. I mean, the history of astronomy because of the mathematical background but you know cosmography for example cartography i've been doing with colleagues lately things in cartography and uh, i've jumped a little bit between fields what i did not move very much was the historical period so i'm an expert on early modern period and um, let us say from the 15th to the 17th century more or less and this is the only area you know time frame where i feel a certain a little bit of comfort mm -hmm. when I move away either for example to earlier periods you know even middle ages or or, mm. or ancient times I'm out of my you know expertise a little mm -hmm. bit but I remember one of the first time we talked mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that you were interested in exploring a bit more uh, the middle uh, oh, yeah, middle yeah. ages yeah, medieval sometime, period yeah, sure. And so you are open to other periods. absolutely and antiquity also. Yes, and absolutely. And I've been I, 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 from time to time I'm forced to move away from these two areas, mm -hmm. and I, I've even I even published you know papers. But this is my my main point mm -hmm. in this <coughs> chronological uh, segment. I've been interested in uh, different disciplines and. Um, but you know i have this maybe it's i'm completely deluded <laughs> i have this impression that after you know i would say 30 years of continuous work in this area i sort of start to more or less understand what was the mind of uh, you know i would say an european in the 16th century and i more or less uh, figure out how those people thought at least i have this impression mm. uh, that's um <laughs> 
uh, talking about European or uh, in middle uh, middle ages we would call it Christianity uh, one of the things that you stressed in your classes mm -hmm. which I attentively uh, <laughs> followed uh, is the unique quality of mm -hmm. Europe during not only the mm -hmm. Middle Ages but also mm -hmm. the early modern period uh, the quality of uh, learned people mm -hmm. that uh, the, the the amount of learned people that they had in society mm -hmm. not only at uh, what we would call today the PhD mm -hmm. level but also yeah. the intermediate mm -hmm. levels of mm -hmm. knowledge yes and that would uh, confer um, Europe uh, mm -hmm. unique quality mm -hmm. Yes, well, this is not, you know, very fashionable to say it nowadays, but, but there are things that you notice in, in, in when, you, when you make a cross-section in society in Europe, one identifies an interest for natural phenomena, which we can, you know, very broadly label the interest for science, but an interest for natural phenomena and for explanation, rational explanations of natural phenomena, one identifies it at almost all levels in society, from very low levels to even to the to top levels. And this is quite unique, I mean, at least not with, with the shape that it took in Europe. And, in, and, I mean, and, and then this has to do with the completely different trajectory that Europe had from other regions, where you have absolutely outstanding you know, people doing remarkable work in all cultures, cultures around the world but then those societies as as a whole did not have did not have this trajectory which Europe acquired after I don't know the 17th 18th century which really made the whole difference in technological and scientific terms and this for me it's absolutely undeniable I mean it so and you know explanations were many times located on intellectual differences which maybe there is some some reason there or in economic differences you know typical marxist approach and there is some reason there some reason there some uh, there are arguments there but the most important uh, thing for me is the the configuration the social configuration for the interest for nature is very peculiar in europe it's very peculiar in europe like uh, uh wanting interest in knowing how it works how it works, how it works. Yeah. yeah well we're not saying that it's best or worst it's just no, different. no it's an story absolutely each culture is absolutely. unique in oh, itself yes. yeah, absolutely and it, it is tied also to you know to the educational system to universities which are very awkward you know institution but very typical of europe etc so uh, well not not i i don't claim any type of exceptionalism but given the absolutely different you know scientific path that the western world took i don't think we can avoid trying to pinpoint some sort of different at a certain moment mm -hmm. i mean i know that this is not very fashionable but it's i mean we cannot run away from this well, difference is I, I good it means diversity oh, each yeah, culture has different yeah. things to contribute i think it's perfectly fine yeah. mm -hmm. so so um regarding the history of astrology mm -hmm which uh, you have uh, backed up a, a lot mm -hmm. uh, in the department. Uh, mm -hmm. The Astra is headed, uh, it's, it's headed here. Um, uh, what do you think? Well, it's, it's, a, well, it's a very interesting... Well, it's all. Yeah, well, <laughs> first of all, you know, as you know, you, your you know, audience does not know, but you know this. I'm not an, I'm not an expert on the history of astrology, which, which you are. Uh, you know much more about the topic than I do. But but I, I was always interested, and I will tell you why. Uh, but not as an expert. And uh, uh, well, in order to understand, we need. Let, can I, you know, just spend one or two minutes, uh, very rapidly, almost telegraphically, telling a little bit about the history of science and its relation with with astrology. So, as you, as people, are, you know, you are certainly aware. But for people who are listening to us perhaps they don't know the history of science is a very recent discipline mm -hmm. quite considerably recent I mean it's much much younger than political history or the history of art or whatever so the history of science you know, I, I would say you know from the you know 18th century it started from the 18th century and then it developed throughout the 19th century and it started from you know historical works or historical detours that scientists wrote 
in their scientific books. So you were writing a book about chemistry and then you would preface it, it with, you know, like 30 pages, the history of your discipline. Mm -hmm. So when, when, when the discipline starts, it starts with this shape. It was, you know, scientists telling about what they thought had been or what they perceived as having been the past of its own discipline. And this exercise, it is impossible to do it without putting oneself at the end of the, of the, of the path, of the historical yeah. path. So, this immediately introduced an enormous bias. So, these men, they would look at the past of their discipline and they would be brutally selective. Mm -hmm. They would make, you know, you know, enormous amount of selection because mm. they would throw away lots of things just to select the ones that they could put on a continuous line until them mm -hmm. until you know mm -hmm. their own time like and they were the apex and they were the apex yeah. mm -hmm. and 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 furthermore not only they did this selection but this selection was also it was not only intellectual it was also moral in the sense that were they were the apex of a continuous path of progress improvement. of improvement yeah. so they were at the very end of the improvement now if you if you think of this this is you know a total you know brutality when you do this to historical events because you know. so this characterized the history of science for a long time for a long time the history of science was was you know very triumphal you know it's it is you know documenting this triumphal progress of mankind understanding the world with the power of reason etc 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 okay and along the way you look you threw away a lot of things, lot of things. <laughs> yeah. for example the most obvious thing was that you would throw away theories you know scientific theories mm -hmm. that were not precisely in tune with this behavior uh, then you call them wrong theories. They, they were called wrong mm -hmm. you know, because they were not in this line. Okay. So this is very important to understand. The history of science started in a very, very, very selective mode uh, in, in this mm -hmm. time. And as you can imagine, a body of knowledge such as astrology was I mean, dead from the very beginning. It was over mm -hmm. because this has nothing to do with me. I mean, you know, I, so and, and this was so so it was literally a non topic. Mm -hmm. So so when the history of science in, throughout I would say eighteenth, nineteenth century maybe in, in broad terms, mm -hmm. it was literally a non topic. It, there was not even a question of introducing it. It was not science. So it had not it had nothing to do with science again. Okay. So this was the first the first uh, thing. And also at the same time it was a very intellectual history. So science was an intellectual product only it had not to do with with communities or with institutions or nothing it was just an intellectual product and so uh, and so we all know how this first effort more or less um, crystallized it crystallized in a, a narrative which is very crudely the following so uh, the progress of science is something that keeps on and on it's a triumphal thing and it is the dynamics of it is coordinated or uh, put into motion by a very select number of persons, and we call them genius. So mm -hmm. we have these persons, the genius, they they make this thing moving. Okay. It's like a history of heroes. Yeah, history of science. Heroes. Yeah. Everybody. Okay. Okay. You know, but but the history of science, you know, in the 20th century especially, already from the beginning of the 20th uh, century, first decade, started to mature. It was so people became much more reflexive, and became much more, you know, attentive to what they were doing. And at a certain point, it became clear that for a number of scientific, you know, bona fide scientific disciplines, you cannot disentangle them from astrology and this mm -hmm. was obvious in the case of astronomy mm -hmm. so in the case of astronomy it was obvious that if you wanted to do really good work in the history of astronomy you were forced to work with the history of astrology too and this was done for a number of time but historians did it 
not, you know, thrilled with the pros prospect. I mean, it was, you know, in the very well-known phrase, it was a wretched topic. <laughs> so you see, we are we are going to study it because we realize that we need it mm -hmm. understanding a little bit astrology otherwise we do not understand the true scientific disciplines but well we don't want to you know enter much very deep there because i mean this is it, it, so it was something secondary and most of all it was an observation of astrology from the outside you could from the outside look at yeah. astrology for example from this this moment you you start having very good works on you know the the social role of astrologers for example or the social networks these type of things which are you know very valid of course mm -hmm. but you know this is a type of approach that you can engage into without ever really entering astrology itself and so there was an enormous development of this i would say for some decades until i don't know the 60s the 70s or even the 80s mm -hmm. this was the, the the sort of development that it, we had. It was probably the safe way to do it because addressing astrology could uh, end a career. Absolutely. Uh, at a certain, oh, absolutely. At a certain point. At a certain point, this was, of course. So you were allowed to, but it, it has to be completely distinguished. But the most important point from the scholarly point of view is that you would not really enter the field trying to understand its inner logic. Mm -hmm. You would, no, I don't, I'm not interested in yes. this. But this changed, of course, I would say, I don't know, 70s, 80s. It clearly changed in the past 30, 40 years. And this is the present situation. So the present situation is the following. We realize that this is an Im immensely important body of knowledge. This is wholly regardless of the personal position of the person studying. This is, mm -hmm. Today is completely acquired. That you, I mean, the personal position of the person, it's, 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 to a certain degree, it's completely relevant in this story. Yeah. As long as the person requires, well, I need to understand, but truly understand this body of knowledge, and I need to understand it with its own categories, not with the ones that I impose from mm -hmm. the outside. Mm -hmm. And this is where we are at the moment. Now, you ask me, so what needs to be done? Well, I would say pretty much everything. <laughs> <laughs> because people, when, you know, start, when, when people start doing this, they realize, oh, my God, we, we don't even have the basic texts studied. The basic texts of the, this body, the enormous body of knowledge, we don't have, you know, modern editions. So, you, you picture this, the late 19th century, second half of the 19th century, was the golden age for the edition of texts in historical mm -hmm. studies. You know, the made political texts, but also the scientific, you know, the big, big, you know, editions of the major, you know, from, from Archimedes to Euclid, etc. Yeah. This is late 19th century, beginning of 20th century. It was all done. At the, of course, there are still things to do. But in astrology is now coming to this point. Mm -hmm. Now, we are coming in astrology, we are coming to the point where all the sciences have been, you know, 100 years ago. We have a so there's a delay in scholarship of about year. 100 years. Yeah. So, <laughs> what is the situation now? Well, the situation now is very interesting because it is the following. It is, and this is something that appeals very much to me, you have an enormous body of knowledge, practices, you know, doctrinal, doctrinal background, but also social context, institutional connections, uh, impact on society, enormous mm -hmm. body, which is astrology. But when you look carefully, you really don't know much about it. So we all agree now on the importance. People, I mean, uh, there are very few scholars that nowadays call it, you know, a wretched topic, mm -hmm. a wretched <laughs> subject. But, but we realize, well, we know so little. For example, where are the main texts? How were astrologers trained? Mm -hmm. where, where did people learn? You know, the, very, the, the most basic questions, we are, you know, chasing mm -hmm. them from now. So it's very exciting from this point of view. It's very exciting also. It is. We, we are like, a, we have like a one century jet lag mm -hmm. compared yeah. to yeah. other sciences. Yeah. But they're still, it's, it's a good place to be, actually. Yeah, it mm -hmm. is. But uh, yeah. one of the things that uh, non-historians would uh, argue is, uh, why is astrology in, with sciences? Why is astrology considered uh -huh. a science? And uh, normally, well, uh, 
it's more like a, a corpus of knowledge. Yeah, well, this is, the, I think, one of the most basic misunderstandings about astrology, and there are reasons mm. to explain the misunderstanding. The basic misunderstanding is that people who know nothing about the topic or just, you know, don't realize that astrology was always an attempt at understanding the natural order of the world. So, so the idea, of course, of course, there were at the margins. You have deviations from this mm -hmm. program. You know, there are deviations to occultistic practices and to divin to divination and things like this, and even to magic. But this is marginal, I would say. The the core astrology was always an attempt to understand the natural order of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, if you had to, you know, make a brief definition of science, it would be identical an attempt at understanding the natural order of the world mm -hmm. so you know the what what of course in in, in in what concerns methods and you know the background philosophy you can spot differences there are clearly differences. i mean they you know people that were fully engaged in astrology were very aware of these differences and the differences are basically you know tetrabibulus versus almagest it's very clear, I mean, it's very clear to everybody that there's a difference there. But as, as all doctrine explains, the two, you know, the two paths, the two ways are attempts at understanding the order of the world, the natural order of the world. So mm -hmm. probably we should... So well, most people don't, don't realize this. And, 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 and also most people don't realize that there is an inner pulsion in astrology, which is, you know, some sort of for knowledge about mm -hmm. the future, knowledge about mm -hmm. the future, which is identical with the one in science. I mean, if you had to, if one had to characterize what is the top ambition of science, but well, the top ambition of science is not simply to understand nature, it's always to predict what is mm -hmm. going to happen. So the pulsion is there, come on. I mean, mm -hmm. this is one of the reasons why astronomy was so was such a model to all sciences. It was such a model because not only because it was mathematical, okay, mm -hmm. but it could but because astronomy could make predictions and mm -hmm. the ability to make predictions and I mean, every day, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is why we don't trust economists. <laughs> <laughs> because they use lots of mathematics but they cannot predict. They yeah. cannot predict. <laughs> so well, when you look carefully <laughs> when you look carefully and trying as much as possible to abandon prejudices, you see that there are there is there's an enormous area of, of common of common state of mind mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. this is why it is not strange that so many astrologers were or top scientists or so many top scientists you know practice astrology yeah. so yeah. probably one of the first things we should uh, question is the the contemporary mindset that uh, puts astrology into the occult sciences mm -hmm. because it was more like a natural uh, knowledge of the world yeah. as you said yeah, yeah. Uh, so probably this is one of the reasons why astrology is misunderstood today. Yeah. Because yes, it had these yes. rules and um, no. this goal, as you said. And it falls from the map of sciences. Mm. Oh, quickly. that is another thing. Why, yeah, why so, is it that... Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I think after the you know, 17th, 18th century there are big transformations and those need to be studied carefully. Because, you know, what was some, something like a common you know, pursuit, then it's split all over. But so after that period, I think there are major differences. The, 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 the contemporary perception is, I mean, I think, well, how shall I put it in a polite manner? <laughs> <laughs> there's no polite manner. There's no polite manner. Yes. I mean, we live in a media culture. I mean, there's no point. I mean, what people, you know, the perception that normal people have on any topic, absolutely any topic, is the perception that is provided by television and newspapers. Mm -hmm. and, and this is generally ludicrous, I mean. And this is true for politics, for philosophy, for astrology, for religion, for, mm -hmm. you know, for justice, you know, for law, for, for everything, for science. It's, I mean, when one sees what goes on in television as in the name of science, it's, it's completely crazy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we should not pay much attention. You know, astrology has the same problems that all areas have. I mean, the, the perception... What the media provide is it's mm -hmm. ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but there is a topic I would like to mention uh, related to this. It's on why why is it so important? And I've never seen this very much discussed. I always comment this on classes, but you, of course, if you attend my classes, then you try to 
as fast as possible to forget everything that I said, <laughs> which is, which is <laughs> obviously <laughs> the only sensible thing to do. But, uh, I have the impression that, you know, mm, how shall I explain this? Well, people have in, in a problem that is constantly mentioned is how, how to explain the longevity, the longevity mm -hmm. of astrology. I mean, it keeps on and on and on. And what, you know, the standard reply is because it makes this promise of being of of, of possibility to know mm -hmm. something about the future. And I think there is a grain of truth here. That it, there is some truth here. That you know the, this promise of you know knowing something mm -hmm. about things that will come. This this to a certain extent explains the enormous longevity of astrology. But I think there is another reason which is never mentioned, and I, I find this very important for historians. And, uh, and I've been, you know, writing about this and commenting on this, but never, you know, really took the shape of a paper or a major contribution. But one day it will be, and it has to do with the following: astrology provides a cultural, sophisticated background in which to plant assertions that are true but you cannot demonstrate that they are true mm. and this I will try to explain I mean if you are if one is brutally strict on the requirements of scientific proof in past ages but even today but let's think only of the past in past ages you would lose lots and lots of knowledge about the world mm -hmm. knowledge that you had about the world but you were not able to prove it you know mm -hmm. typical you know just typical example you know in, in portugal we have this so the this is very common as a saying in in, in in the portuguese people if at sunset the sky is red tomorrow we will have good weather it always works right <laughs> it always works of course but nobody knows why. I mean, we can know how today, very modern, it's very sophisticated, but for centuries nobody knew why. Mm. And yet, it always works. And yet, the knowledge of this has direct implications in life. Mm -hmm. So, what can, we do, can you do? Can you just throw this away just because you don't have a demonstration? I mean, if you... Yes, if you insist on having, you know, epistemic criteria, a la Aristotle, you would have to throw this away. You don't know the cause, you know, mm -hmm. and you would have to throw this away. This, I mean, this would be completely suicidal if you if you threw away this. So, what 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 did societies needed? Societies needed, or they made use of this, was a body of knowledge which was you know respectful like astrology was and where this type of assertions could live mm -hmm. as true assertions although we don't have a proof and you would put them you know in, in the language of astrology I mean some connection with something mm -hmm. going on mm -hmm. but they survived so the true statement survived for centuries after centuries after centuries in the absence of a proof mm -hmm. And it was very important that the true statement survived. Today. Now, when was this critical? In medicine. In medicine, this is obvious. I mean, even today, we know so little about the functioning of the body. Now, imagine in the Middle Ages, in the 16th century, people knew near to nothing, but they knew some things that worked. If you do this, this will happen. Yeah. Why? We don't know. But then what would you find? Oh, you, you have this, you know, this framework, which is mm -hmm. literary, mythological, astrological, where the statement survives. Mm -hmm. It is, you know... And so this networking of true statements in a broad system, you know, of, you know, mythology, astronomy, literary things, allowed true statements to survive. And I think mm -hmm. this was very important to explain why astrology is, and it's very important for an historian of science, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 And you're now researching, your research uh, areas are completely uh, different nowadays. You have a project. Uh, yeah, well, a project yeah, yeah. on um, on traveling, really, uh, yeah. discoveries and traveling yeah. and all that. Uh, yeah. 
Do you want to know about this? Yes. Oh, yes, yeah, of course. This is a great project. <laughs> Could you tell us a little yeah, bit? Yeah, so, so the project is called Rutter. It's, uh, well, uh, you know, the starting point is a, a careful and critical study of rutters or sailing directions. These are documents that explained how to do long distance o oceanic voyages in the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century, right? Mm -hmm. So they have a previous tradition, but only the oceanic rutters are the, the truly important ones. Now, these documents are very interesting for many reasons, but because they, they document the acquisition of information about the world on the scale of the whole planet. So you, you mm -hmm. take someone going from, from Europe and going to Asia, mm -hmm. you know, this person in a ship would, you know, cross several oceans, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, many continents, etc. Mm -hmm. And it would it would be always gathering information about you know about what meteorology, currents, sea oceanic currents, winds, so meteorological phenomena, atmospheric events, animals, plants, magnetism, all of these things are recorded there. And and so this is the first importance. You have so nautical rutters are the first documents that I am aware of, where in a systematic manner you have the the phenomenon of acquisition of knowledge about the natural world at the scale of the planet, not locally, but at the scale of the planet. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now from this study, I want to show that it was this phenomenon that then ultimately led to global notions about the earth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the earth, I mean, you, we have these globalized ideas about the earth. and But, the, the, you know, the idea that we have as the earth as a single object, a single, you know, natural physical object, where, you know, you have this, where common events happen, you know, common types of winds and things like this. And, this is a very sophisticated idea, and my point is, and this is the point of the project, this idea was not acquired purely intellectually. It, it is the consequence of the lived experiences of tens of thousands of people, hundreds mm. of thousands of people, because starting in the 15th century, you start having, you know, long distance, and long distance is critical here, long distance sea voyages, by tens of thousands of people and then hundreds of thousands of people. And all of these pe persons collect this information, discuss this, you know, and comment mm -hmm. in, on the earth. And so, and, and it's about the effects of this. Mm -hmm. And um, so what is interesting in, from my point of view in, in this project, where there are many, many interesting things, but one of the interesting things is, is that a, a very, you know, sophisticated concept as the one that the earth is global i mean this is so important nowadays when you have all this discussion on climate change and things like this it's critically dependent on understanding the earth as a global but unique entity um, all of this is the result not of you know the work of isolated geniuses you know mm -hmm. reading books in libraries mm -hmm. but it's the result of hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of people common people moving all over the earth Mm -hmm. And by this phenomenon of moving new concepts, so con there are conceptual mm -hmm. changes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is part of mm -hmm. the story. Mm -hmm. And then, well, there are many, you know, sub chapters in the story. For example, one that probably will interest you. I'm I'm interested in seeing how nautical knowledge, so knowledge about oceans, mm -hmm. uh, moved from culture to culture. And the, the the most interesting example of this is the Indian Ocean, where there was a very highly developed Arabic tradition of sailing and then the Portuguese arrived there to the Indian Ocean and mm -hmm. in a very short period they controlled enormous parts of it but they copied and they got as much as possible from the Arabic you know mm -hmm. the, the, the tradition mm -hmm. this was never studied and we are studying it now this transmission and then after some decades the Dutch and the English arrived and they took as much as they could from the Portuguese <laughs> so you have the, uh, a very interesting phenomenon where you know from Arabic seamanship to Portuguese seamanship from Portuguese seamanship to the Dutch seamanship and to to the British seamanship and it's very interesting how you know these are you know like you know translation problems but mm -hmm. when you look in detail it's very interesting mm -hmm. 
and uh, I have a, a absolutely superb team. So the the, the 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 researchers that came to work with me, they are just top level, very very good, and I'm absolutely sure that they will do very good work. And I'm just like you know, sort of maestro, <laughs> seeing that everything moves because they, I mean, they are so good. They're 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 they're, they're very sharp and very hard working, but very you know. Mm -hmm. sharp in what they want to say and what they are already mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. but I but I keep on doing some things in astrology yes. too <laughs> yes, but, uh, with, with, with some collaborators that exactly. I have <laughs> collaborators <laughs> that do Ab Astra podcasts when they should be working <laughs> <laughs> on their own <laughs> yes. on their own PhD <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, professor. Thank you very much uh, no, no, for for your. Uh, no, no, congratulations for this. I think this is uh, this is this is one of the new th directions that you know uh, academia has to move into. You know, this uh, we have so many new possibilities of discussion among scholars and engagement with the public, with mm -hmm. the non-expert public. That is, is yeah, I, I think you would agree with me, they are very lightly explored yet. Mm -hmm. And this type of you know, things, you know, podcasts, and it's, uh, we, we need to increase this much more and, mm -hmm. and do it much better and you know, learn from the experiences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So congratulations. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And thank you very thank much. Thank you for this, for, for giving the time here. for this. No, no, it's, it's a pleasure. And I, I always follow your careers very attentively. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a pleasure to uh, wow. try to learn from you, as you know. And it was oh, a, thank uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> trying to, you know, to see this you know, new technological leap <laughs> that you gave moving into put the podcast, mm. podcast thing. It's great. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you.